fun? No, I played with it, but I don't have any. It's just another tool, and us tool junkies, you know, we got to have all the tools. Uh, I'm going to show you how to use them and some tricks on that. But first off, always got to talk a little bit about safety. We've got new people here tonight. So there's some things you need to know. A lathe is one of the safest machines you can have in the shop, but if something happens, it happens at lightning speed. Never stand in the plane of rotation. Always try to stand to the side because if this piece of burled whatever goes apart, it's going to go up or back, and you don't want it to climb up in your face. You should wear a full face shield, dust mask, because faulted wood has got a fungus in it. You get that fungus in your lungs, you can get pneumonia, and it can really kill you. The other thing is, if you have long hair ladies or guys, you want to tie it back. At SWAT one year, we had a lady doing pen turning. She got her hair in it, ripped out some of her hair, and doggone it, she didn't go right back at it, because wood turning is addictive. So just be cautious. Safety glasses, uh, I got a full face shield, probably won't use it too much tonight. So I'm going to get on that. And, and I'll tell you something. I know a lot of turners wear <coughs> gloves, but you will never see anything other than nitrile glove around me. I've seen somebody get their hand ripped off in a metal leg. Mm -hmm. Not pleasant. So no gloves no for me. But if you do have wood comes off there and hits right here, it can burn. Yeah. But you got to be cautious, like Alan says. You should not use gloves around turning pieces of wood. And I'm going to have my watches. So, see that a lot too. the other thing is, you can make the beautiful piece, and you take it into the house and show the significant other. I call it DB. You know how DB, DB yep. is, dearly yeah. beloved? <laughs> so here I got chips falling off of me, and I'm showing this thing, oh, she's seeing chips. So I've got my uh, badge of honor here. I don't have one from the Alamo Club. But yeah, I do. Alamo Woodturners Club, right there. So maybe I'll get a new you badge. Get a new one. So, I have an old smock at home. I don't wear it here because it's pretty ragged. Because that sap and stuff comes out. But you want to keep your, your chips in the garage or your studio. Right? Studio. Everybody has studio. So when you take that beautiful stuff in the house, she sees the beautiful stuff, not all the chips on the floor. So, face shield. <coughs> I have a full face shield. Keep in mind, a piece of uh, 10 pounds of whatever comes off that hits that face shield. And you can see I've got some scars on it. It's going to knock your head back. It's not good. So still stand to the side. And I was standing over here when that piece came off and it came up the tool and hit the face shield. So keep in mind, it's, I don't want to scare you. I just want you to be aware there is some dangers on it. Now I brought my uh, handy assistant, the old guy, here with me. And he likes to say he keeps me on track. Actually, he just likes to heck with me. So, <clears throat> so the D-Way beating tools, I would start showing those in a little bit, but one of the things you need is get your piece round, and I'm going to do a little bit of that right now. Now, I like to use the hunter tools for this. Now, this lathe is not set up for me. The tool rest, in my opinion, is a half inch too high. You want to have your hunter tools, I think it's right there, basically on center line. And you can see this tool is a little bit high, so I'm going to have to lift it up. What I want to do is get this round and smooth to start with. That's just to start with. What I want to do is, like I say, get this edge fairly smooth. Tool rest is a little bit big for what I'm going to do. <clears throat> so, since that's a little bit high, I'll go to the other hunter tool like I gave you, and I want to chew that up just a little bit more. Normally I start things between centers. I was, I'll put a face plate on here, and I did that on this one, and I had the face plate, this piece over here next to the face plate, 
and I put a tenon on it so I can grip it. Now I do things a little bit different. I do backwards because I do vacuum chucking. So I always keep the, the tailstock up until I get it roughed round because I don't want that piece coming out of this chuck. Somebody mentioned earlier about how many chucks I have. Uh, six or eight. Now that was just to remove that little divot right there. <clears throat> so, next thing I'll do is sand this, because when you're using the beading tools, there are some things that you need to keep in mind. If you want a couple beads and then a flat spot, you've got to sand that first, because if you put the beads on there, then you sand it, you're going to have flats on the top of your bead. So the piece needs to be sanded really well. And I brought my noisy vacuum here tonight, so I got my trusty drill, and there's some tricks to sanding. Turn the speed down, and is if the worst thing you can do when you're sanding high speed and a drill, it heats up the Velcro, it melts it, it ruins it. So you want to turn your speed down, <clears throat> and I've got a couple neat tricks here. This is a hundred grit. No, don't turn that on. Leave it alone. It didn't turn on. Leave it alone. Oh, <laughs> you've got it on over there. You sneaky thing, you. I told you he's going to heckle me, but it didn't work. Normally I'd wear a dust mask on here. And if your lathe has the reverse, it's best to sand forwards and then in reverse. They don't save me at all. <clears throat> now I'll go through the different grits. Do this rather quick. The first couple of grits I want to do both directions. The reason I do both directions, it gives a cross uh, scratch pattern so it removes any ridges. After the first couple of three, that's 120 grit. Then I'll just use it go in the same direction. That's where you don't want to be breathing in dust. You want to have a vacuum and uh, keep it like away from you. After about 180 grit, what I use next is the uh, sanding wizard from Vincent Welch. This is a, this is what it is. It also has another handle here if you want to get into some really deep stuff. You can adjust the angle of the head. It has a straight shaft if you need it, but I like this angle hat. Now, if you can see, maybe, I don't know, on the video, you see it wobbling a little bit? They don't have a TV. Oh, oh gee whiz, I can see it. But when it's wobbling like that, it really does a nice finish. So after you get to about 180, 220 grit, if you change to this, you'll get a superior finish. Now you notice I keep the interface pad on this, because if I do get it too hot, which I won't, and I ruin the interface pad for $2, I don't ruin the uh, main pad, which is probably about $20. I'm not sure exactly the cost right now. <clears throat> See how it's working? And if you turn it this way, it stands like that. Does a great job. Normally what I do is I'd sand up to about 400 grit. Since this is a demo piece, I'm not going to sand any further than that. But, get those out of the way. Um, somewhere in here. There. Did you bring any of this? His Good old Mr. Vincent Welch. I was going to say, did you bring any of his cards? Yeah, here's some of his cards to pass around. And he donated for your raffle a two-inch sanding disc. That two-inch will go on that sanding wizard. 
I really like it, so pass that around. Now, once you get this sanded smooth, it's time to think about the number of beads that you want to put on here. Now, I got the whole set because I'm a tool junkie and I wanted to show them. And I will pass them around in a little bit. There's one sixteenth, one eighth. Um, How many, as he's thinking, can you smell the smoke? How many of you have used Vincent's wood blender sanding disc? Good stuff, eh? That's all I use. All I use too. So I'll pass some of these around in a little bit, but this is a 3 16 beading tool. You can't see it. Put it down. So, Put it down. Does that help? I guess it'll be on the video later, all right? We hope so. Me too. That's the plan. Now, one of the things that, like on a bowl, you need to think about, think outside the box, how you want to decorate the beads. Now, on this piece, I'm just going to show you how the beads work. You don't need a handle for these because they work really well. And the idea is to hold it in this position right here. Now this tool rest is a little high, but I think I can make it work. Not that way. And don't need to be really fast speed. Now if I'm going to put several beads on here, I need to think. Two beads, three beads look better. Four beads, five beads look better. Six beads, seven beads look better. So an odd number of beads seems to be more attractive on a piece. So hold this down like this, and the first thing you want to do is just lightly score it. The reason you want to lightly score it, if I'm going to put three beads on there, I'll move over, mark the next one. Move over a little bit more, mark the other one. Now I notice in this tool rest, I can't hold the tool like I do on my leg. So it, it's going to grab just a little bit. And I left a little bit area out here kind of like a picture frame, if you will. So you need to think about those things. So then you go back in that groove and you rotate and twist it back and forth just a little bit. And when you hear starting to squall or chatter a little bit, you need to stop because I'm going to show you a trick in a little bit with some magic juice. <laughs> Magic juice. In Tennessee? What's that? In Tennessee? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then I go over to the next one, rock it back and forth just a little bit. <coughs> you hear it starting to squall just a little bit? Stop. Because I don't want the top of the bead completely rounded. Because <clears throat> I'm going to use that magic juice. And if you notice, it's cutting really fine shavings. So, now you can see that the beads are starting right here, but this magic juice that I got right here, I squirt it on. Now, not 100% sure exactly what this does. I'm saying it lubricates the, the fibers of the wood so that when you come back, You can watch till the, the top of that bead from flat until it turns round. And it's not tearing the grain out because it's lubricating the fibers of the, the wood. It's changed the surface tension, if you will. You can actually use, listen, you can actually use rattle can lacquer and spray it, but that's kind of expensive because you're going to go back in and turn it off anyway. So, what are you using? What is that? Magic juice. <laughs> Better known is that for sale at Tommy.com? <laughs> Better known about, well, my wife got this little squirt bottle somewhere, and I was asking her to get me one. It's a Dawn dish soap, about two tablespoons, and maybe this little bottle, maybe it's a tablespoon and a half in plain water. So, the soap and water is lubricating the wood so you get a better cut. Make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Now, I made my own handles for these because these come unhandled. And I'm a hacker machinist, as you all know, so I made handles. You don't need the handles for them, but I'm getting a little bit of arthritis in my hand right here, and it's a little bit easier to hold this handle than it is the tool. I used the, the tools right off the way it was for a long time. Now, there's different ones. I don't want those. Oh, you want now? Not now. I want a, another tool. Um, the other important tool, I'll, I'll make some other beads here in a little bit, is this uh, teardrop tool. You could also use a diamond pointed tool to roll the bead, because right now I've got a sharp edge right here and a sharp edge in here. That don't look really good. So I need to roll a little bit of a bead there to smooth that out. And this diamond or a teardrop tool works excellent for that. I keep looking at the switch, it's different than my, my lathe. So, you put it in there, and then roll, roll the bead to the outside. On the inner one, put it in, and roll towards the center. I know you probably can't see that over here, but uh, those are pretty smooth beads. Now on the outside, I could do the same thing. If this was going to be uh, the top, lay it on the side and roll the bead around. Now, if these get dull, and I've used them for a long time. I suppose the only time they really get dull is they roll off and hit the floor, concrete. You can use a diamond hone. This is a 400 and a 600 grit. It's just a little credit card hone. And all you really do is, is after you've ground these on your six or eight inch high speed, low speed grinder and put the profile on there, if you need to sharpen it, I'd put a little bit of water or a little bit of the soap on there to lubricate it. And all you do is until you see the shiny spots where the two little points are. Any questions on sharpening? Once, maybe a year, you might have to go back to the grinder and then touch up the profile on that. So, I'll pass this around, let me put it back in the handle. This is a 3 16th. And what I've done is I've made it where my set screw is uh, to the side. And the label for that size is at the top, so I can look at it really quick. Any questions on that part? So, <clears throat> now I'm going to show some of the other beads, you know, Minute. The different ones here. Johnny, it's hard to see back here. Are you trying to move the up? Yes, the tool is used with, this is the largest one, it's used with the bevel to the top. Okay. The bead is on the inside right here. It's like this. Okay. What I'm doing now is just getting those beads off. Because I'm going to lay out a, a series of beads to show all of them. Now on this one here, I'm not going to uh, use the lubricant on it. So I want to do a small I just pass that one around. This is a 1 16th inch bead. I'll put it right here. And I'm 
I'm rocking the tool back and forth. I'm going to try to complete these beads. As it starts chattering, I may have to stop and use a magic juice. Normally I would mark the next one before I cut it completely, but I'm wanting to show you what the beads look like. It cuts from one side to the other just a little bit better that way. If you just go straight in, it don't cut as good. If you rock it a little bit, it kind of works itself in. That's starting to chatter a little bit. I put some magic juice on there. And then the so what I want to do is because I've got a sharp surface on each area, on the little bead, I come back in and lightly roll that bead to the inside. On the outside, the larger bead, I roll it to the outside. Now, I've never had the tool grab and walk like you will um, a skew or yeah, skew, love to hate them, or a, a gouge. And if you have a little bit of line, you can go in and clean that bead up and go right into the bottom. Okay. So now I'm going to take this out and pass it around so you can see all the beads. Any questions on that part? The tool you just used, all you did was define, use one leg, one yeah. point. Well, it's a, a pyramid or a, a round teardrop type tool. So on oh, the inside of the bead, okay. I smooth it. On the outside of the outside bead, I smooth it. I thought it was another. It was a smaller beading tool, but it's the round point. Right. It's okay. a teardrop tool. <coughs> if you do need to sand, and you see some areas, sand from the bottom to the top. Pardon me. Never sand from the top down, because you want to leave the rounded part of the bead at the top. If you sand from the bottom up, it smooths that out. Now, as you can see, I don't need to sand that. Pass that around. <clears throat> I have a few examples here I'm going to pass around so you can see what some of them have done. This is a uh, stabilized with cactus juice and green dye. That will be a Christmas ornament. The outside's only turned. I haven't finished it. This is ambrosia maple. This is a, uh, a platter that I got carried away with the beads, <laughs> uh, maple, so nice. another maple platter with numerous of the same size beads on one side and several beads on the uh, top, and I had tags on them to tell me which one was what. Um, this was the one with a, a plain top surface on it and beads on the bottom. Now, of course, DB does the pyrography. I cannot do that. Vietnam and the first Gulf War made me a basket case. Thank you guys for your service. And this one here is not completed yet. This is another Beads of Courage box. I normally do not take it off my chuck until I vacuum chuck it and then I'll finish the bottom. But I wanted to bring it tonight so you could see what the beads look like for uh, one of the beads of courage bowls. And I still have to go back inside and turn just a little bit on the inside because I have a little uh, ridge in there. But I wanted to show that to you. And then I'm going to, you can do boxes. 
and I'm going to show you how to do uh, side grain. That all was in grain. Side grain is a little bit different because you have the way the uh, fibers of the wood goes back and forth, so you're hitting side grain and grain. This is a little box. Now, I have made a lot of pop lidded boxes, but if a uh, sweet lady puts her $1,000 earrings in here, and she, where'd they go? So a lot of people like a little box that has a lid to lift off of. You, you got those thousand dollar earrings, right? <laughs> so these are just examples of what you can do. Now, one of the latest things I've been working on is little acorn birdhouses with beads on them. Now, I'm going to show you how I make one of these, but I've got these to pass around. I'm not sure which ones I glued. I think I glued that one together. Great Christmas present. Now, this one here is not glued together yet. And I like to drill, some of them I drill a hole in to make it look like a little birdhouse. Some of them I don't. Um, you ever purchase some birds on them? Yeah. I, I put, you get those little Hobby Lobby little colored birds and put them on there. But these are for the really small, small birds. Texas mosquitoes, maybe. How many of you have ever used the uh, small chucks? Love them. I've got two of them. I'm thinking about buying a couple more. I recommended it last year, and I put it out of order one. Yeah, they're great. The only drawback is they only have a one inch eight thread, but you can get what they call a converter. I call it adapter from one and a quarter or 33 millimeter down to one inch. Love them. The best ones on the market are Bulldog. By the what? Yeah, those have them. I know where you get those. <laughs> <laughs> You have the adapters like that too? Yeah. Oh, you get these in craft supply. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't know where else. You get them you, locally. Do you get them locally? Yeah. Okay. How much are they locally? Oh, I just redesigned the jaws on my small one so that the minimum diameter on three quarters of an inch, and I've thickened the jaw up about three times what those are right there. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, you got some great it's tools. Real Unfortunately, I got these before I saw yours. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do have a training policy. <laughs> as I, as you, some of you know, I'm a hacker machinist. So to make those birdhouses, or the little acorns, I made my own drives that goes into Morse taper. You don't need something fancy like it. I've made these everywhere from one quarter inch all the way up to one inch, but you drill the one inch hole with your regular portion bit, or seven eighths or three quarter, whatever size you got, and then of course that fits right on there. Well on my lathes, it fits right in there and I can turn the outside down. No, no. But I just brought this to, you can make your own drive. What is it, that draw bar expand at the end? Is that what? It yes, it's got a taper on it. When I tighten it down, it expands it out and it holds it. Holds it. How many of you have made more taper drives? I made one once and then I'll never do it again. The easiest way to make one of these, and I didn't, uh, you, you bring your, your spur center that goes in the number two more taper. Oh, that's the green. Yeah. What you do is you take any of your Morse tapers and you take a piece of wood and you glue another wood piece of wood on it. After that's dry, you take your um, Morse taper and lay it in there and put the other piece of wood up next to it, glue it. You could put screws in it, but I never had the need. So that gives you the gauge to make your Morse taper. That's really important. So after you've done that, you take between centers, I'll explain this. 
you take it between centers, and when you're turning this down, you, I don't know if you can see that, you turn this down until it just fits in. Now I've made a little recess right here so when I hit it with a knockout bar, if it mushrooms a little bit, it won't bind up. So you turn that down and keep checking it until your Morse taper fits in your block. That's between centers. After you do that, then you take it and put it in here and bring your center up and you gauge from your drill. Oh. You use your calipers and measure your drill bit. It don't matter what size you've got. If you've got some of Alan Trout's little bitty acorns, you can make a drive to make little bitty acorn boxes with that drive. So since this is a one inch, I've measured that. And once that's in, I'm not used to this monster. So you start turning this down until your calipers, I leave them just a, maybe a 30 seconds oversized when I'm getting close to the size. And once I get that, I take my drill bit and take a piece of scrap wood. This is a piece of Venetian blind and I drill the hole in it that is the size of the drill bit. I use the drill bit to drill the hole in it. So then I start really easy or slow, start tapering this until this just goes over the end. That's perfectly one inch. And then I'll go ahead and turn it until it completely fits. So that's a one inch drive now that fits the hole that you drilled in here. Got that? Any questions? It's a few step process to, to do that, but once you've made one, then all it, all it is is a matter of, wow, something's way off on this thing. Yeah. Is this thing not, I didn't check the alignment on it. No, it's just it, a jack. It's it suffers from the JET syndrome. It's great, and then it takes about three hours to do that. Uh, that bed's like a noodle. It's quite a bit off. Okay, so that's how this fits. Now, I will have the back up a little bit because when you want to turn this piece right here, turn it, no, I don't have that on it. You turn a tenon on it to hold the end of it and drill the hole in it. Does that make, make, make a sense here? I'm not used to changing back and forth. My leg is, is like this. So with your piece of wood on, I won't have to do this. I drill my hole with my uh, one inch Forstner bit or whatever size you're going to make. Okay, and That goes right in there. I believe it does. So that's the size for the drive, okay? That's important. Now to fit an acorn cap, you take whichever acorn cap that you're going to use. These are the largest acorn caps that I've ever found. One of the guys in the church. Well, the I've ever found. The guy in the church brought them to me and he said he got them from some park somewhere. I said, hey, great. So I made him, uh, him and his wife a few and gave them back for Christmas presents. They love them. So if you have access or know where some large ones are, I think the man's digging some out here. Woohoo! <laughs> I caught the handle here. Those are nice. Where do you get those? River Rock? <laughs> Walk? Uh, we, we, uh, where we live, we have a couple of fir oak trees. Okay. And I get them there, and, and then this lady right here brings them. Super. You're so nice. The neighbor has a tree, and when we walk in there in the street, I get her up. <laughs> That's those great. Are, those are small compared to their big ones. Yeah. Well, I live up on the hill country where it's dry and no yeah. water. you got so much more. Um, or, I mean, rain down here in San Antonio. Yeah. Yeah, right. Nothing grows up there but rocks, and when it rains, they grow really good. Anyway, you take whatever size cap that you have, and you measure the inside of it, and there again, I'll leave it a little bit oversized, and I'll turn this down 
until I have the tenon just about the right side. And when I, what I use on that is the uh, little high speed tool, uh, skew, and of course I'll true up the face and I'll start turning it down. <coughs> and when I get where the calipers go over, I'll start checking with the cap. And at the very last, I'll turn the speed down and get the tool rest out of the way. And Okay, that holds the cap. Now one of the things that you need to do is, okay, I need to put an eye screw in here. Okay, how are you going to do that if you take the cap off? Well, I've shown you in the past years, a little bottle, there's a bottle, on the Christmas ornaments, out of Miesel hardware, I get really tiny eye screws. So with this thing turning, I can kind of see where the center is. It don't matter if it wobbles just a little bit, I drill a hole in it. And this is the, I don't know if you can see that, this is the size of the eye screw. They have them several different sizes, but this is the smallest they have. That's Miso hardware. Um, and then, while it's still on the lathe and you find out where that little hole is, you screw the eye screw in. Do you ever glue the caps on? Yeah. yeah. So this is just right now to line up because when I glue the cap on, if I don't have this, the ornament will hang a little bit crooked. It's kind of neat when you find one that has some odd yeah. shapes to it. Mm -hmm. But the only way that I found, I mean, I could put that eye screw anywhere, and you can use a fish hook, cut them off, put it in there. But that's the only way I've really found to really hold them correct, or, you know, parallel. So once I've done this part, that's all done. Now, I will take the little wire, like some of the ones around, and, and straighten them and then put them on there. So once that part's done, then I can take, yeah, uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave this one on here for right now. Because one of the things I will do, and I haven't done it, is I want to take and hollow this out a little bit on the inside. But I want to make sure that I leave some of the flat spot in the front and back to, to set on here. Now I can make this longer so that it would go to the full length. Because if I turn the bottom out where it's really thin, then it can wobble. And when I'm turning those really thin, I have uh, my gauges. My gauges to gauge the wall thickness. It goes in there, and this is how thick this is. So I'm not going to do this one because I want to hollow it out to make it a little bit lighter. And that gives me the thickness on those. So I'm going to do this one right here because I want to do it straight. And I'll probably need that again. Any questions? Sorry? I just asked him if he had one like that. Oh. I'm always asking him because I'm always hunting some too that he doesn't already have. I did. I, I, somebody in the club had asked me to bring some down. I do have a set of three, and they're only twenty-five dollars for a set. If anybody's interested. So now, what I want to do? I'm sorry. I think that was Gordon. Yeah, maybe it was. He's not in here now, is he? But I didn't bring them down to sell. But if you want one, of them, they're available. Now I've measured this. I'm starting to get confused on which cap I made this one for. <laughs> and we just added more to your confusion. Yeah. What so this one? Well, I'll figure that out later. Yeah. So now to finish this, I'm going to put beads on it if this machine will allow me to do that. Okay? Now I want the and what you have to do is kind of measure the wall thickness, which I know how thick it is you can't turn the beads far enough down that you cut through the wood. So that's very important to have a gauge to find out how thick they are. So I'm going to put some beads on this. It's turning pretty good. Normally I would re that once I put it on my drive. Same thing, if I want to put a series of beads on there, 
I want to score them first. This makes it look kind of like a little, uh, one of those little beehives that you see on the Winnie the Pooh. So once I get them scored, I rock the tool just a little bit. Main thing is get that tool back in the groove and that puts out some really fine shavings. When you say rock the tool, are you rotating it or are you moving the handle back and forth? Yeah, you see how fine these are? I'm rotating the tool back and forth like this, just slightly. I'm exaggerating. Okay, but so you're rotating, not racking the handle. I'm not racking it back and forth. Okay. I suppose you could, but I found that if you just rack it back and forth, rotate it back and forth, it works a lot better. Now, I suppose you could swing it back and forth. I've never had a need for that. More of a rolling motion. Right. And you can see the real fine shavings. And the reason I'm keeping the tailstock up, the further away you get here, it starts vibrating a little bit more. Now you can use any size bead, but keep in mind, like I said, you need to measure how uh, thick your wood is. Is if I was using the largest tool, I might cut completely through Now you can hear it starting to chatter a little bit. Now I'll come back and use that magic juice and clean up those beads. And with a uh, magic juice on there, sometimes it will get on top, so rake away from the tool. Don't rake towards you. Because those points are very, very sharp. And when I'm doing this, I can see the flat spot just go away. When that just goes away, you want to stop. Okay, now the Now because on the top here, I've got a really sharp surface, I take the uh, teardrop tool and just relieve that a little bit. Because I want to leave that shoulder because that's where the cap seats on. And on the bottom, for right now, I'll roll this over. And if you're a little nervous and you get a little bit off, you can always go back in between each one. And if you see a flat spot, you can true it up a little bit. Okay? Now, is, is that the that um, teardrop tool is one of Dave's too? Yes, it's yeah. one of Dave's tools, yes. It can tear out. That's why you don't want to go to the top. You put the magic juice, the soap solution on there, which lubricates and it, it actually expands some of the fibers of the wood so you can get a clean cut. It don't matter if it's the smallest one or the biggest one. I always stop before I get to the top of it. Now, this I'm going to bring this on down. Down to 
Uh, on the very bottom, you could put a little teardrop on there, a little acorn. You could do anything you want to the bottom. So on this one, I'm just going to part it off. This is just to show the bees. Some wood better to bead than others. Um, any of your hardwoods work really good for bees. If it's a soft wood, it probably wouldn't work. Now you can see when I cut it off, it started vibrating a little bit. That's because it's not being supported. I would sand that just a little bit to smooth it up. Because even though it's vibrating, my fingers are taking care of that. And I would go ahead and sand it. And then I put just a little bit of uh, glue on there. Was this one of you? No. This one's for this one. That's why I normally do these. Oh, there it goes. You don't have to glue it on because it's a tight fit. Okay? Any questions on that part? Okay? <clears throat> Now I need a uh, spindle adapter. It's very handy to have these spindle adapters when you're visiting nice folks in other clubs. Uh, Tommy me what? Tommy what? Up in the top. I'm going to make sure this one. That's all you got. Now on, on my lathes, sometimes if I'm going in reverse, I'll tighten up the set screw. These don't have a set screw in there, so if you turn in reverse, or sand in reverse, you need to make sure that's pretty tight. Because you don't want that thing coming off, especially if you've got a pretty heavy piece of wood on. Now this is a a platter. Looks like a bowl to me. Uh, what is the difference between a bowl and a platter? Yeah, I I think it is. Well, a platter don't hold much soup, I can tell you that. <laughs> it's the difference between the height and the width. <laughs> You can call this a bowl if you want. You can call it a platter if you want. It really don't matter. We could put cookies in there. Yeah. Now, where are the cookies? There's two. There are two trains of thought. How many have a vacuum system here? Oh, you're lucky. Because I do everything. I think about the end product. It don't matter if it's a bowl or a platter or a plate. Because I know if you've got holes in a piece of wood, you can't use a vacuum. And one of the things you're all aware of, if you have lightning in the area or the possible power outage, don't use your vacuum. No vacuum, you've got flying saucers or flying bowls. And they can go out across the shop, down to the neighbors or whatever. But what I normally would do, if I'm going to bead the bottom, I will do that first, like you've seen on some of those. If I'm going to bead the top, then I'll finish the bottom completely, vacuum chuck it, turn it around and be on my vacuum and then I'll put the beads on the top side. So you got to think about the end process. And I kind of like both. Beads on the bottom give you a nice feel when you pick it up. Otherwise, beads on the top feel pretty good on your thumb because your thumb's usually on the top. But you have to look at the, the area that you have to work with what you're going to do with beads. Now if you have a bowl steady rest, how many have bowl steady rest? The rest of you need to get one. I didn't bring mine tonight because uh, it's set up for my lady that might be in his shop right now. When you put a bowl steady and those two wheels are sitting over here, it reduces the amount of vibration. You will improve your performance of bowl turning dramatically with a bowl steady. Because what happens when you go from side grain to end grain, the wood is starting to flex in and out. With a bowl steady sitting right there, it stabilizes where your cut is. You'll get a much better performance. Now, with something like this, I can put my hand over here because I've sanded both sides really smooth. And I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a couple beads on the bottom if I can get this thing to work. If you put beads on both sides, you got to consider wood thickness, right? You got it. And how you do that? Well, it's the radius that you're... You've got... It depends on the thickness. Now, right here, I've got probably close to three-eighths of an inch. Obviously, I'm not going to use a three-eighths beading tool because 
I could put a 3 8 bead on here, but I'm not going to have very much material left. I'd probably go with a 3 16 bead, quarter inch possibly. Offset. You could offset them. It might not look right. Because you've got to think about how it looks and how it feels. So I'd probably only put beads on one side. So I'd probably, like I say, just put it on one side. But yes, you've got to pay attention to that. You've got bow tie calipers that you can use and you can see the thickness. Well, the problem with the beads, this will not quite go in there. That's why I've made this tool, and you can see I took, took it to the uh, uh, vise and anvil and pounded it down so it mushroomed it out so it won't fall out. And then after I pounded it down, I kind of lightly ground it so this can set in the bead and give me a better reading on how thick my bead is. If you want to check them on some of those, you can. But you got to keep that in mind. It's a very good point, Gordon. So, let's see, 316. I think I'm going to go with an eighth inch on this. And then I'll go with a um, uh, three eighths on the inside. Because it's nice to have a, a surface area to put your name. Everybody does a signature on their work, right? Depends on what it looks like. Sometimes we put other people's names. It doesn't look very good to use Robert. <laughs> Robert Robert's got a lot of stuff on <laughs> Why are they picking on you? Uh, I'm used to it. So I don't know if you know, I'm going to put three beads on the inside of this, so when you pick it up, you can feel those beads. So I laid out my beads to start with. And I'm putting my, my hand on the back. If I had my bowl steady, I'd probably put it on the back, which gives me a little bit better performance, because you don't want to hold that too tight. You just want to reduce the noise. Here again, I'm rotating it back and forth, and because this is thinner, you're going to hear more chattering because it is thinner. Noisy, isn't it? Getting ready to come off. Going choo -choo 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 -choo. You're going from end grain to side grain. Do they like that? Choo -choo -choo. Stop it and look and see if your beads are perfectly round and they look pretty good. Okay. So then you use the teardrop tool because you don't really want that sharp area right there. And I'm just rolling the bead to the outside with the teardrop tool. I have used the diamond tool for that, but I find that teardrop is better profile for it. And now the inside.
Now I've found that using the magic juice or the soap solution, after you, you finish up like you've got a little bit of uh, uh, soap here on the outside, it, you take your sandpaper back and just lightly sand that and I won't completely finish it tonight. That removes that soap from that edge and finish, it don't bother the finish whatsoever. I've used depth on it, I've used the doctor's, uh, what do you call it Gordon, doctor's uh, workshop. Yeah, works really nice on bowls and things like that. Any questions? What were the proportions on your magic juice? It's about, uh, uh, for this small amount, it was uh, about one and a half tablespoons of uh, Dawn dish soap. I suppose you could use any dish soap and fill it up with water. Okay. And what a, Maybe a cup or less. It's a six That's, ounce bottle. Yeah, this six ounce. I have a, a bigger bottle like that, like a, a water bottle that I started with until the wife found this one. She forgot she had it. And I just poured some in here. So it's not a critical solution. And if you want the, to go to the site, I, I don't have enough of these, but I have a few. Uh, the D-Way site, if you go and Google D-Way tools, there are several videos that the guy that makes these has on the site, and it, it explains a lot about his tools, how to sharpen them and stuff <coughs> like that. And uh, he's by far uh, a lot better at that than I am. He's got them on YouTube. YouTube, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, if you go D-Way, uh, it'll come up with the YouTube videos. But Google D-Way tools, that's the first thing. Um, seemed like I was going to tell you something else. Let me look at my list. I went different from what I, I normally have. I always do. So that's basically it. How are we doing on time? You good? It's you're 10 after. Okay. Yeah, you're 10 minutes late. <laughs> good. No. So what I would also do is I'd probably put a bead right here, and that'll probably be the larger bead, and then I'd move over and put another bead, and it leaves me a signature place to put on, on the bottom. Uh, I won't do that tonight because you've seen how the beads work. Question. What do you use to sign your... It's called DB. <laughs> My wife does all of it. She uses a um, Detail Master Pyrography pen. Well, it's a little, it's not a pyrography pen per se, it's the small um, writing tip that you get on the detail master. And you can see the bottom of the, some of the stuff yeah. I passed around. Really fine. Yeah. She does finer stuff than that. On some of my Christmas globes and ornaments, she's got it so small you have to almost use a magnifier. I, I can't do that. I've done some pyrography, but she's the expert at it. I mean, she says she's not, but she's very really talented is. at that. She is. She put that signature on before or after the finish. She likes the signature before the finish is on it because if you use lacquer or the, the any type finish when the, the wood turning burning tip hits it, it smokes more and she don't like the smell. So a lot of times, depending on what I'm making, I'll take it in, especially the beads of curries, and she will put uh, the, the name and beads of curries or whatever on it before I completely finish it. Like that bowl that's got the beads on it's not finished yet. I'll have to reposition it in the chuck and finish the inside and then finish the outside. I'll take it in and she will uh, put a finish on it. If there's any finish that you like is okay. Uh, I like the uh, spray rattle can stuff for a lot of things, but sometimes it leaves little um, roughness on it. But if you take a regular brown paper or uh, shopping bag, grocery bag, and you just rub that with a brown paper, it smooths a lot of that out. One of the other things, I know a lot of you don't work in corpus, do you? Well, if you have a hospital or a, an office building, they have these great, great big floor buffers. In the center of the floor buffer, they take these out and throw them away. So I've talked to our cleaning people, if you will, and I should have talked about this earlier. There are several different grits. The white is very fine, the red is coarse, Let's see. The no, green is medium and the red's coarse. If you have some raised grain on your beads, one of the things you can do is take whichever grit you want, and it's basically Scotch Brite, and you hold it next to your beads. It won't it won't flatten 
the beads. And obviously if you get it going too fast, it'll melt this stuff because it's a base age sandpaper. But it'll smooth those beads out dramatically. And then when I put the finish on there, uh, I can put these in on the hand drill and run them back over the finish and finish them up that way too. It takes off those little blisters, if you will. Almost forgot about that. I know you can buy the Scotch Bright at Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, they throw these away, so I have them throw them called my way. <laughs> um, I did bring another plate in case I got that one too far along. Some more maple. But, and this one I'll probably do different. I like beads on different sides. And uh, people really like to feel them. I hope, did you like the feel of those yeah. beads? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just a, another tool, another avenue to dress up your turnings. Any other questions I can help you with? You, you, you buy a set of those beading tools? You can buy one or you can buy all of them. And they come unhandled. They don't have a handle in them. But you can put them in any of the handles. I'm sure they have the handles here. It's a 3 8 shaft. Yes. But the problem is... 50 or 60 bucks a piece, something like that. That's what? 50 or 60 bucks a piece, I don't remember. They're about 45 yeah. to some bucks, but with shipping is about 50 bucks yeah. a piece. And they have the parting tool I didn't use tonight. I really like it. It works really well. Um, so you can buy one, two, or all of them. And because I was, I'm doing demonstrations, I went ahead and took the bullet and bought them, and I made my own handles for them. Because, like I said, I'm getting a little bit of arthritis in my hand, and it just feels better. But you don't need a long handle. You can use these without handles. And I just put the, the labels on them, because when they're laying in my little box there, it's easy to see what size it is. It's just a little stick-on label. Every guy's got a label maker, right? Right. <laughs> Remember the old Enterprise? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> haven't heard that years or years now. Yeah, okay, any other questions? Well, thanks for having us down. Okay. Raffle tickets. Gordon? Yeah, I'm over here. Gordon, would you want a set of those gauges? Oh. Would you want a set of those gauges? Uh, yeah, I'll be up just a second. You got two sets? Yeah, that's, they're 25 a set. Yeah, I'll get it. Okay. You got five? I know. You got five? A five? Okay. You have ten? Here's five. That's one set. They're 25 a set. Yeah. So there's 20, one. 25. Yeah. So do you want two sets? No, one set. Oh, okay. That's why I was confused about it. I think you, you want to take this off? Yeah. Let me take everything off and put it back in. Up, What's that? I'll take a set up. Okay, thank you. Go. Oh, excuse me. I'm working. I mean, you want it off your chest? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. No, I don't want it off your chest. Yeah, I'm going to finish that later. <laughs> Could let, could let people come up and try them. Oh, no. <laughs> you probably heard a lot, a lot of people saying the same thing. What? I got busy with the holidays and forgot about the wood. <laughs> oh, oh. That's fine. It's in a store uh, over across the street here. It's not in my way at all. Oh, okay. But still, I would give it to you. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we could meet over there. I thought about uh, packing it a lot more way, trying to get rid of some of that way, but it's raining. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, some of that is uh, really gorgeous stuff. Uh, that, uh, uh -huh. Oh, yes. Uh, half of you, half of you. Uh, uh, one quarter? Uh, 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 some of it's, you know, this wide. So, you know, a band so you can You've got to clean it down because there's some rough uh, marks on it. He does home repair stuff.
So he's saying a lot of the way. Yeah. I didn't know the kid, but I saw the. Uh, My buddy is the uh, curator. Yeah, this part of the museum.